Are there any undercover feds here? So you raise your hand, please. Um, it's worth a try. Um, OK, well, if there are, then I, I have actually a message for you. Uh, well, the first part is fuck you. Um, <laughs> And the, the second part is that when he was on trial for his life in Jerusalem, part of Adolf Eichmann's defense was that nobody had ever told him that what he was doing is wrong. And I wanted a matter of public record that what you are doing is wrong. And I plan on seeing you held accountable. I don't know if you know this, but the, uh, the first version of the movie Star Wars was uh, written by environmentalists. The first version was not the same as the way the version that, that we've all seen ended up. Um, is there anybody in here who doesn't know how the movie Star Wars goes? Oh, that's pretty damn cool. There's actually one person here who doesn't know how Star Wars goes. No, that's great. That's a very good thing. Um, the, I saw that movie, gosh, I saw that movie when I was like 16 or something, which is about the right time to see it. Um, I saw it again recently, and God, it's terrible. Um, but back then, I was like, oh my God, the acting is so good. And um, I mean, I really liked it a lot. I, I, I wasn't one of those people who saw it, you know, like a thousand times or anything. I mean, for one thing, I wasn't that much of a nerd. And for the other, I was way too busy playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, <laughs> and, um, but for those, for, for those of you, for, for the one person here who doesn't know how the movie goes, the way Star Wars goes is at the end of the movie, there's the Empire has built this giant Death Star that is a machine that's capable of destroying entire planets, which is a wonderful metaphor for the whole dominant culture. And um, then the rebels find a way to blow up the Death Star by dropping a uh, torpedo through a thermal exhaust port. And no, I'm really not a nerd. Um, and uh, so Luke Skywalker uh, uses the force to get past all the TIE fighters, and, and then he drops, the, he drops the, the torpedo down the thermal exhaust port, and it blows up the whole Death Star. And that's pretty much the end of the movie. Um, but the first version was not written by, by Lucas and company. The first version was, the first draft of it, was actually written by environmentalists. And so it's, it's slightly a slightly different movie. Well, and for one thing, it's not called Star Wars because that's so violent. Instead, it was called Star Nonviolent Civil Disobedience. Um, um, and um, the instead of actually blowing up the Death Star, the uh, the rebels use other tactics to slow the intergalactic march of empire. For example, this is what I actually have in my hands a very rare first draft here. Anyway, for example, they set up programs for people on planets about to be destroyed to produce luxury items like hemp hacky sacks and gourmet coffee for sale to inhabitants of the Death Star. <laughs> Audience members also discover that there are plans afoot to encourage loads of troopers and other citizens of the Empire to take eco-tours of doomed planets. <laughs> the purpose will be to show to one and all that these planets are economically important to the Empire and so should not be destroyed. In a surprise move that will get viewers to the edges of their seats, other groups of rebels file lawsuits against the Empire, attempting to show that the environmental impact statement that Darth Vader was required to file failed to adequately support his decision that blowing up the planet would cause no significant impact. <laughs> viewers will thrill to learn of plans to boycott items produced by corporations to have Darth Vader on the board of directors. And they'll leap to their feet in theaters worldwide when they see bags full of letters written directly to Mr. Vader himself, asking that he please not blow up any more planets. And scribbled in the margin is a note from one of the screenwriters that says, for accuracy's sake, when we show examples of these letters, it's imperative that all letters to Mr. Vader be respectful and courteous, and that they stress the need to find cooperative solutions to the differences between the rebels and the empire. Under no circumstances should the letters be such that they would alienate or anger Mr. Vader. If the letters upset Mr. Vader, the rebels' letter campaign to the Grand Moff Tarkin will certainly fail as well. <laughs> Other plans include sending petitions and filing lawsuits. Now, we all know that that would be sufficient not only to bring the Empire to its knees, but to make a damn fine and exciting movie. <laughs> the thing is, there's more. Thousands of renegade rebels, unhappy with what they perceive as toadying, on the part of the mainstream rebels decide in a scene guaranteed to bring tears to the eyes of even the most cold-hearted theater goers to stand on the planets about to be destroyed, link arms, and say, give peace a chance. 
<laughs> they send DVDs of that to Darth Vader and his boss, the Grand Moff Tarkin, to whom they also send wave after wave of loving kindness. A few of the rebels sneak aboard the Death Star and they lock themselves down to various pieces of equipment. And then stirring debates are held on screen among those rebels as to whether they should voluntarily surrender on approach of the troopers or whether they should remain locked down to the end. And in a brilliant and brave touch of authenticity, the rebels are never able to come to consensus. <laughs> Um, okay, once inside the Death Star, there's a splinter group breaks off from those about to lock themselves down. And they rush down these hallways and they somehow avoid all the troopers and they burn a couple of transporters and they use chemicals to etch Galaxy Liberation Front on the walls of the Death Star. <laughs> and then there's a group that breaks off from them and they sneak through all the hallways, they get past the troopers and they make it, they actually make it all the way to Darth Vader's headquarters and Darth Vader's all by himself. And they sneak up behind him and they hit him with a vegan cream pie. <laughs> the producers decided to take that, that scene out because it was too close to another movie they were developing at the same time, which was called The Plot to Pie Hitler. Um, <laughs> thank you for that laugh. Um, you know, I've been, I've been telling that joke for like the last six months, and this is the only audience that's laughed at it yet. So thank you. You, you obviously have very good taste. Um, um, anyway, near the end of the movie, there's a debate held among the rebels. And that was actually a problem I had with this particular screenplay, is there was a bit too much debate and not quite enough action. <clears throat> <laughs> so as the Death Star looms directly overhead, a few of the rebels advocate actually picking up weapons to fight back. And they're generally shouted down by the pacifist rebels who argue that attacking those who run the Death Star is just another example of the Empire's harmful philosophy coming in by the back door. They say that the rebels who want to fight back are simply being co-opted by the need to control things. If we want to change Darth Vader, they say, we must first become that change ourselves. <laughs> to change Darth Vader's heart, we must first change our own. We must, above all else, ha all else, have compassion for Darth Vader. And remember that he, too, was once a child. <laughs> and one writer put in the margins, excellent, that will be sure to moisten the cheeks of sensitive people everywhere. And he didn't mention whether those tears would be of frustration. Um, <laughs> Finally, Leah, Luke, Han, Chewbacca, and a couple of robots show up, and they tell the others they found a way to blow up the whole Death Star. And the rest of the rebels, including those who'd previously been in favor of, of surgical strikes aimed at removing Darth Vader, are horrified. They say, voices firm behind the sobs, you can't blow up the Death Star, what about the janitors? <laughs> they say, you, Leah, Luke, Han and Chewbacca are heartless and cruel. And so in the exciting final scene of the environmentalist version, there's a scuffle breaks out between Leo Luke, Han, Chewbacca, and the two robots on one side and the pacifists on the other. And the pacifists chase them from the room and from the film, which is not a big deal since they were minor characters anyway. Um, and so then what happens is the Death Star looms closer and closer. And audience members just chewing their fingernails, waiting to see whether the letters and petitions and lawsuits work their magic. And, um, <laughs> and viewers see the lasers inside the Death Star warming up to destroy the planet. And then the, the, the lasers they glow this hellish red. And then you see the planet. And then you see the Death Star. And you see the planet. And you see the Death Star. And you see the planet. And then you see pss, this little spark of light. And that's, of course, the environmentalists getting away before the planet gets blown up. Um, and then the, the planet, of course, gets blown up. And then the, the, the final shot of the movie, which reveals what a complete triumph this was for the rebels, is a still showing an article on the lower left of page 43 of the New Empire Times that devotes a full three sentences to the destruction of the planet. So like, yeah, we got some press. That's the end of the story. Um, so I, I did a talk in Asheville, North Carolina a couple years ago. And during the Q&A, somebody asked, how many environmentalists does it take to change a light bulb? And I said, I'll bite. How many? And he said, it wasn't a riddle. I was just asking you. <laughs> I'm like, that's not how this is supposed to work. And that night, I went back to my hotel, and I'm really fixating on that question, which says a lot more about my social life than I wanted to. <laughs> and, um, and I finally came up with an answer, which is how many environmentalists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is 10. One to write the light bulb a letter requesting that it change, four to circulate online petitions, one to file a lawsuit demanding that it change, one to send the light bulb loving kindness, knowing that's the only way real change occurs, 
One to accept the light bulb precisely the way it is, clear in the knowledge that to not accept another is to do great harm to oneself. One to write a book about how and why the light bulb needs to change. And finally, one to smash the fucking light bulb because we all know it's never going to change. <laughs> This, by the way, is how I know we're not going to have a revolution, because if people will pay for water bottles and plastic, they'll suffer any indignity. <laughs> so as a longtime grassroots environmental activist, and as a creature living in the thrashing endgame of civilization, I am intimately acquainted with the landscape of loss, and have grown accustomed to carrying the daily weight of despair. I walk clear cuts that wrap around mountains and drop into valleys and climb ridges to fragment watershed after watershed. And I've sat silent near empty streams that two generations ago were lashed into whiteness by uncountable salmon coming home to spawn and die. A few years ago, I began to feel pretty apocalyptic. But I hesitated to use that word, in part because of those cartoons I've seen of crazy penitents carrying the end is near signs, and in part because of the power of the word itself. Apocalypse. I didn't want to use it lightly. And then a friend and fellow activist said to me, so Derek, what's it going to take for you to finally use that word? Will it take the death of runs of salmon so large that people were afraid to put their boats in the water for fear they'd capsize, so large that horses were afraid to get in the water, so large that you could hear them for miles before you'd see them? Maybe it'll take the death of flocks of passenger pigeons so large that they would darken the sky for days at a time rolling thunder, moving 60 miles an hour. Maybe it'll take the death of flocks of Eskimo curlews, almost as large. Maybe it'll take the turning of the sea off San Diego into a dead zone. Maybe it'll take the turning of the Gulf of Mexico into a dead zone. Maybe it'll take docks and every mother's breast milk. Maybe it'll take global warming. Maybe it'll take the hole in the ozone. You know, give me a specific threshold, Derek, a specific point at which you finally use that word. So, I want to talk tonight about Endgame, the book on the reality, and the way, I mean, that book really began from a fundamental question of, do you believe that this culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? And, you know, I, I've asked that question of thousands of people, and nobody ever says yes. Oh, one guy at one of my talks raised his hand, and everybody looks at him, he said, oh, voluntary, no, of course not. And, <laughs> Um, so the next question is, if you don't believe that the culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living, and you care about the land where you live, what does that mean for your strategy and for your tactics? And the answer is we don't really know. And one of the reasons that we don't know is because we don't really talk about it. And one of the reasons that we don't talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that we have hope. And I'm going to do some serious hope bashing later. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so that's really where I want to, and that's really what the book is about, is, is if you don't believe that the culture is going to undergo a voluntary transformation, what do you do? And so I think what I would like to do is, um, is go through the premises of that book. And one of the reasons, I, one of the things I've done in, this, in, in Endgame is I put my premises in boldface in the front of the book. And one of the reasons I did that is because one of the first rules of propaganda is if you can slide your premises by people, you've got them. About Hitler, it was said from insane premise to monstrous conclusion, Hitler was coldly, icily logical. So he would say, what are we going to do about the Jewish problem? Gosh, Adolf, good question. What are we going to do about it? But see, what he's done is he's slid the premise by you that there's a Jewish problem you have to do something about. Or similarly, you hear some uh, talking head on television say, so how can we make the U.S. economy grow? God, good question. Well, OK, some of the premises. A, we want the U.S. economy to grow. B, we want the U.S. economy to exist. C, who the hell's we? <laughs> and so like I said, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to slide premises by people and so I, the, the, the structure of this talk is going to be that I want to go through some of the premises for that book. And the first premise is that um, industrial civilization is not, and civilization itself, but especially industrial civilization, 
is not and can never be sustainable. Um, civilization is not and can never be sustainable. A few years ago, I was riding in a car with a friend of mine who, we were stuck in traffic and I was just making conversation and I said, so George, if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George can sometimes kind of be a curmudgeon and that day was not in a good mood and he said, Derek, that's a really stupid question. Um, we can fantasize whatever we want, but the truth is there's only one level of technology that's sustainable and that's the Stone Age. And we're going to be there again someday and the only question really is what's going to be left of the world when we get there? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of living that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. In fact, it takes anybody but a rocket scientist to figure that out. <laughs> and I mean, if your way, oh, let's back off for a second. I want to go a different direction. We'll come back to that. That before we go any further, it's like, okay, that's nice. What's civilization? And you know, I've been bashing civilization for about 15 years now, and so I figure I'd probably better finally define it. And the definition that I'm using is that civilization is a way of life that's characterized by the growth of cities. And that's defensible both linguistically and historically. Well, that's nice, Derek, but what's a city? And a city I've defined as a collection of people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. And what that means is the Talawa, on whose land I now live, were not civilized. They didn't require the importation of resources. They didn't live in cities. They lived in villages, camps, and once again, they didn't require the importation of resources. They would eat salmon and clams and huckleberry and salal and salmon and salmon <laughs> and salmon and salmon. And then usually through the winter, they would eat a lot of salmon. Um, <laughs> and the Talawa lived there for 12,500 years, if you believe the myths of science. And if you believe the myths of the Talawa, then they lived there since the beginning of time. And this culture has been there for 180 years, 170 years, and the area is getting pretty trashed. And oh, it's so funny, I got to tell you this. I did a talk at Princeton last spring, and during the Q&A, this guy, this guy says, you know, you say the Tala will live there for 12,500 years, but that doesn't mean that they were sustainable. <laughs> I asked him why, and he said, because, we, he actually said this, he said, because we don't have quantitative analysis showing, you know, it's like we can just stop there. Um, <laughs> we don't have quantitative analysis showing there were the same number of salmon now as there were 12,500 years ago. And I said, okay, if 12,500 years isn't long enough for you, what if they were there for 20,000? No. I said, okay, 30,000? No. I said, give me a number. I mean, you want quantitative analysis, like 100,000, is that long enough? And I said, what about the San Bushmen of, of what's now South Africa? They evolved in place. So they were there, they and their evolutionary predecessors, like two million years, three million years. Is that long enough? It's like, we don't have the data. <laughs> anyway, um, so two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One of them is that your way of living can never be sustainable because if you require the importation of resources, it means that you've denuded the landscape of that particular resource. And as your city grows, you'll denude an ever larger area. And and denuding the landscape of a resource is harms the land base. It's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, I know we've all been told that natural selection is based on competition and that, you know, it's all just a fierce battle for who can be the meanest and grab the most resources most quickly and exploit the most thoroughly. But short of showing how stupid our discourse is, I can disprove that in one sentence if you give me a couple of semicolons. Um, <laughs> and that's those creatures who survived in the long run have survived in the long run semicolon. You don't survive in the long run by hyper-exploiting your surroundings, semicolon. You survive in the long run by actually making your habitat better. What a concept. Um, okay, so anyway, um, two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One is that you can never be sustainable, which means we could all become the best little natural capitalists in the world 
and it doesn't matter. So long as there is this fundamental system in place, it's not going to be sustainable. And the other thing it means is that your way of life must be based on violence because if you require the importation of resources, trade will never be sufficiently reliable. Because if you require the importation of resources and the people in the next watershed over aren't going to trade you for it, you're going to take it. Which means we could all become junior bodhisattvas and it wouldn't matter. The U.S. military would still have to be huge because how else are they going to get access to our oil that just happens to be under somebody else's land? Um, if they require that oil, they're going to take it. So those two things are really fundamental. Um, oh, but I want to go even further. And I'm going to say not only is a way of life that's based on the use, oh, no, no, we're going to jump back now. So because I've been talking about resources, so I want to go back to what I was saying before about any way of life. Another way to look at all this is any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources also won't last. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what resource you're talking about. Let's, I mean, you would think that if you have a way of life that's based on the use of, I don't know, let's just choose a random example, um, oil. Um, <laughs> you, would, you would think that you would start to consider what's going to happen when this non-renewable resource runs out. That, once again, just by definition, any way of life that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. And I would go a step further, and I would say that any way of life that's based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources won't last. So if every year there are fewer salmon returned than the year before, eventually you're going to run out. And everybody knows this except for Michael Sissenwine, who is um, in charge of one of the divisions of the National Marine Fisheries Services. And his response when learning that 90 percent of the large fish in the oceans are gone was to say, that's not a problem. We have to ask what level of decline is reasonable or sustainable. <laughs> exactly. And so in basically two sentences or three sentences, he destroyed the words problem, decline, two sentences, he destroyed the words problem, decline, reasonable, and sustainable. Um, so in, in any case, if every year there are fewer passenger pigeons return than there were the year before, eventually there will be none. If every year there is fewer old growth forest, which once wasn't called old growth forest but was simply called home, um, then eventually it will be gone. And I'm going to go a step further and I'm going to say that any way of life that's based on the use of resources won't last because a resource is something there to be used. And there's a great line by a Canadian lumberman, when I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when I look at trees, I see dollar bills, I'm going to treat them one way. I'm going to convert them into dollar bills. If when I look at trees, I see trees, I'm going to treat them another way. And if when I look at this particular tree, I see this particular tree, I'm going to treat it differently still. And it's the same with fish. If when I look at salmon, I see dollar bills, I'm going to treat them one way. If when I look at salmon, I see salmon, I'm going to treat them another way. If when I look at this particular fish, I see this particular fish, I'll treat it differently still. The same is true also of, of women. If when I look at women, I see orifices, I'm going to treat them one way. If when I look at women, I see women, I'm going to treat them another way. And if when I look at this particular woman, I see this particular woman, I'm going to treat her differently still. If you perceive another as a resource, you're going to use them as opposed to enter into a relationship with them. And I need to be really clear that just because I perceive a fish as a fish, that doesn't mean that I can't eat it. And there's, I was doing a, a radio interview in Spokane, Washington several years ago, and the interviewer said, you know, Indians exploited salmon too. And I said, no, they didn't. They ate them. And he said, what's the difference? I said, well, they gave them respect for the spirit in exchange for the flesh. And I knew that that answer was kind of bullshit, but I'm a male, and so I'm required by law to answer every question that's asked of me. Um, <laughs> and so that afternoon, I went out, and I sat next to this tree that I had a long relationship with, and I asked the tree, what is the fundamental predator-prey relationship? And the tree gave me the answer right away, which is, if you consume the flesh of another, you now take responsibility for the continuation of the other's community. So if I consume the flesh of s salmon from the Klamath River, I now take responsibility for the continuation of the Klamath River salmon. And that's, everybody knows this. You know, bears know it, mergansers know it, newts know it. The mergansers know that if you consume all the newts in this pond, there won't be any newts in the pond anymore. And we just forget sometimes 
And that's the fundamental predator-prey bargain that we have to get into. And I want to go, I want to say something else about that, um, and then we'll come back to the other. But um, I got into a big argument with this guy several years ago because he was saying that because I use toilet paper that I am just as culpable for deforestation as the CEO of Weyerhaeuser. And I knew that that was wrong, but <laughs> I, I couldn't really articulate why. And, um, and he said, go ask a tree. A tree will tell you. So I went out and asked a tree, and the tree said, you're an animal. You consume things. Get over it. And, but then I, it also gave me the, the other answer, which is, yes, I am culpable, not because I consume the flesh of a tree. I'm culpable because I consume the flesh of a tree without fulfilling my end of the bargain. I'm culpable not because I use toilet paper, but because I don't stop Weyerhaeuser from deforesting. And that's a much more serious culpability than simply consuming. So I'm not culpable because I consume Klamath River salmon. I'm culpable because I consume Klamath River salmon and I don't take out the fucking Iron Gate. Um, thanks. Um, okay, so industrial civilization is not and can never be sustainable. Um, and that's the first premise and that takes up these two lines. Um, so you all brought sleeping bags, right? Um, okay, second premise is that um, traditional communities do not often voluntarily give up or sell the resources on which their communities are based until their communities have been destroyed. They also do not willingly allow their land bases to be damaged so that other resources, gold, oil, and so on, can be extracted. It follows that those who want the resources will do what they can to destroy traditional communities as we see. Third premise. Our way of living, industrial civilization, is based on, requires, and will collapse very quickly without persistent and widespread violence. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago in, in um, Eugene, and afterwards this guy raised his hand and he said, you know, you talk about how violent this culture is, and I just don't see it. There's no violence in my life. I'm not violent myself. I just, just I don't see any violence. And it's significant to this story, by the way, that it was a man who said it, not a woman. Um, and I said, okay, um, where's your shirt made? And he looked, and it was made in Bangladesh. And I said, do we even need to talk about that? He's like, no. I said, okay. And also, I'm just wondering, do you pay rent? He's like, yeah. I said, why? He said, because I don't own? I said, no, what would happen if you didn't pay rent? And so I get evicted. I said, what does that mean? What, I don't understand. What happens when you get evicted? And he said, well, a sheriff would come to my house, and he would, I said, stop, right there. What happens if a sheriff comes to your house, and you say, hey, I was just getting done cooking dinner. Come on in. Have some food. So the sheriff comes in, sits down, and you cook him dinner, and you feed him, and you don't poison him. And uh, <laughs> then after dinner, he, uh, you say to him, you know, it's been nice having you here, but your company's not all that pleasant, so I would like for you to leave my home now. What would happen? He said, well, the sheriff would take out his gun, and he'd say, I'm here to evict you. You gotta leave, because you didn't pay your rent. I said, ah, so the reason you pay rent is because if you don't, some guy is gonna come to your house with a gun, and he's gonna kick you out of your home. He's like, I guess. I said, okay, let's try it again. What happens if you're really hungry, and so you go to the grocery store, Lots of food there, you know. And uh, you start eating. What's going to happen? So we're going to call the sheriff, and he's going to come. And he's the same, ass same guy. He's a real asshole, isn't he? Um, <laughs> the sheriff's going to come and take you away. So what this means is that in order for you to survive, in order for you to have a place to sleep, a place to be, you have to pay somebody. And in order to eat, you have to pay somebody. It's really weird, and if you don't, somebody with a gun is gonna come and do something bad to you. So part of the reason that a lot of us don't see the violence is because, well part of the reason is a different subject, part of the reason is because a lot of the violence is exported. I was doing a talk in Massachusetts a few years ago, and somebody said to me afterwards, you know, we now are living way more sustainably than they did 100 years ago. 
and I said, how do you, how do you know that? He said, because there's a lot more trees here in Massachusetts than there were 100 years ago. I said, yeah, it's because you're getting all your wood from South America. And so a lot of the violence is simply exported. And then the other part of it is a lot of us don't perceive this violence because we've been so metabolized into the system and we so accept its premises that there's no need to do violence to us because we're standing straight in line. But of course, if we step out the tiniest bit, Got to watch out. Um, oh, but we're not going to do that. OK, now we go to the fourth premise. Uh, this culture, civilization, this, this is, I think my, might be my favorite premise of the book, is based on a clearly defined and widely accepted, yet often unarticulated hierarchy. Violence done by those higher on the hierarchy to those lower is nearly always transparent, invisible. It's unnoticed. When it is noticed, it's fully rationalized. Violence done by those lower on the hierarchy to those higher is met with, is, is unthinkable. And when it does happen, it's met with shock, horror, and the fetishization of the victims. And there's so many examples of this. Um, one example is that within my own family when I was a kid, my father is extremely violent. And, you know, so the violence flowed constantly downhill. And the one time that my brother ever fought back, he got beaten far worse than any other time because, of course, he had committed blasphemy by sending violence up the hierarchy. Uh, that's one example. Um, another example is, oh, I live where there's, there's tons of bears near where I live, and I just, I just love seeing them. Oh, it's so cool. Uh, a mother and baby bear actually fell asleep outside my mom's house the other day. And so cool, I was thinking about that afterwards. How many wild animals have I ever seen asleep? And, well, two bears. Um, <laughs> um, maybe some grasshoppers, it's hard to tell. Um, um, Anyway, so I mean, so but people and I, and I walk, I walk through the forest all the time. I walk through forest at night with no lantern and all this stuff. And the feds going, huh? He walks through the forest at night with no lantern. You can use that. Um, anyway, um, anyway, so I walk through the forest. I'm scared of the feds, frankly, not the, the bears. Anyway, so I walk through the forest at, at night, and and people go, oh my God, aren't you scared of, of the bears? I mean, they could, they could, they could attack or something. And I know that there is one person dies in North America every other year from bear attacks. <laughs> and 46,000 Americans die every year because of automobile crashes. So we're scared of the wrong thing. I mean, we should walk through a parking lot, and it's like, oh my god, you know? The, <laughs> the cars are all going, <laughs> um, um, Oh, here's another one. You know, I live in. Um, I live in Crescent City, which I live like three miles from the ocean, and I never go swimming in the ocean. You know why? Because that fucking movie Jaws. You know? I saw it when I was the same age. The acting was so good in that movie, too. And, um, and I swear, I mean, I get within like 30 yards of the ocean, and I start hearing the fucking theme song. Um, and. You know, or there's this movie, what was it, Spring Break Shark Attack, I think like a year ago or something. I wish there was that many sharks still on the planet. You know, the, the, the ratio of human attacks on sharks to shark attacks on humans is about 20 million to one. Um, but who are the ones who are the killing machines? Um, okay, that's another example. Another example, um, cops. Oh my God, cops. Okay, so I don't need to talk about that one. Um, Every day in the United States, between four and six Americans die because they encountered police. Um, that's through beatings, shootings, high-speed chases, medical neglect, and prisons and jails. Between four and six Americans die every day. And on the other, on the other hand, every time a cop dies, it's this big state funeral, you know, with the bumper sticker, some gave all, all gave some, you know. But does anybody here know what the most dangerous civil service profession is? Garbage collection way the hell more dangerous than a cop. Because you're sitting next to these big fucking machines. These cars are like, we're going to nail your ass. Um, and, um, but when was the last time you saw a, a state funeral for a garbage collector, you know, with a bumper sticker, some gave all and all gave some? Or um, when was the last time you saw a Tom Cruise movie where this intrepid garbage man is cleaning up the mean streets of LA? You know, it's, it just doesn't happen because it doesn't valorize that violence that flows down. Um, Okay, if you don't believe me, that the, the, the violence with the whole cop thing, you know, the violence get, oh, I saw this thing in the paper not very long ago, this is actually about a year ago, where cops shot a, the cop shot a, a motorist. 
And so it's like, okay, yeah, cops shoot a motorist, no big deal. Um, and then also he was, the thing is, he was a uh, Iraq war veteran. And like, the media didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> because suddenly the violence is like, okay, and plus he was, he was Hispanic, I think. Um, so it's like, uh, the violence is like, oh, oh, oh. You know, it's like. <laughs> um, Anyway, if, if you don't believe me about the violence is only allowed to flow one direction with that, the next time there's one of those, you know, like the next time there's a big, big protest or something, uh, maybe anti-war or anti-so-called free trade, you know, whatever, um, just do an experiment, which is take a baseball bat <laughs> and then just walk up to one of the, one of the policemen Aww. and say, excuse me, Officer Friendly, um, nothing personal, I'm just conducting an experiment and hit him, and then hit him a couple more times real fast. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> somebody's gonna take down your name. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, and then I'll talk to you in about 50 years, um, because you've, you've, you've committed blasphemy, you've sent violence up the hierarchy. Um, another example. 9-11, um, you know? It's like, like, when was the last time that you saw a politician not mention 9-11? It was 9-10, actually. Um, because, because that was sending violence up the hierarchy um, for someone in some other country to actually attack uh, Americans. Um, as opposed to, there are a half million children die every year as a direct result of so-called debt repayment. Um, but of course, those are invisible. Those don't count. Um, you know, what was it, like 2,800 Americans died because of the whole 9-11 thing. There was, um, there are about that many, there's about, what is it, 15,000 Americans die every two weeks because of preventable cancers, I believe. Um, but of course, that doesn't count as terrorism. That's not violence. Uh, let's see, there are, how many Americans die every year because of because of unsafe working conditions? Is it 6,000 Americans die? 60,000 Americans die every year. 600,000 Americans. Six million. 60 million. Every American dies every year because of unsafe working conditions. Um, I think it's 6,000. Maybe it's 60,000. Anyway, it's more. But that doesn't count. Um, oh, and then, then I want to say one more thing about this, which is that, that um, and this is gonna have to, does anybody mind if I swear? Um, I think that the word fuck is the most amazing word in the English language because it's all of patriarchy condensed into four letters. Because the same word that means make love to means do great violence to. That's really, really twisted. And it's also kind of confusing. I mean, because so somebody can say to me, like, I'm going to fuck you. And I'm like, <laughs> I need more information. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 it's really messed up. I mean, that, 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 that sex and violence get conflated. That's, that's really disturbing. They get conflated in that word. And then, in addition, actually understanding that helped me understand homophobia, which I had never understood prior to sort of getting that understanding. Um, I mean, I always thought homophobia is just really stupid. I mean, if you don't like homosexuals, you probably shouldn't date one. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I understood it. There's this great line by Catherine McKinnon, man fucks woman, subject, verb, object. Man fucks woman, subject, verb, object that when, I mean, even within the context of a loving heterosexual relationship, this shows how deeply the objectification of women, how deep the objectification of women goes within this culture and within our language, is even within the context of a loving heterosexual relationship, it's really hard to not have the woman get objectified. So the man says to the woman, I would like to be inside of you. You know what just happened? She's the object of the sentence. Okay, on the other hand, the woman says to the man, I would like for you to be inside me. You know what? She's still the object of the sentence. So the man says to the woman, I would like for you to be around me. And she's like, 
I'm sorry, can you speak English? I don't, I don't know what you want. Um, and anyway, b about the homophobia thing, I never understood that at all until, this is back in the whole Clinton don't ask, don't tell thing, where it's like okay for homosexuals to be in the military as long as you don't talk about it. I guess you can do whatever you want, you just can't talk. It's, anyway, but, um, which by the way, I have to say full disclosure here, I have to say that I actually agree that homosexuals should not be allowed in the military. I feel very strongly actually that homosexuals should not be allowed in the military. But that probably doesn't mean as much as it could because I also think that heterosexuals, asexuals, the transgendered, um, bisexuals should not be allowed in the military either. Um, <laughs> oh, but I did have this idea. I had this idea like two months ago, which is what about if you have it so each one has their own army? You know, like you have the bisexual brigade to the rescue or something, you know? <laughs> that might be kind of fun. Um, anyway, so in the whole Clinton don't ask, don't tell thing, I was listening to, to NPR, I'm sorry. Um, I was listening to NPR one day, God help me, and, um, and uh, there was this military spokesman, man, of course, saying that he said, the reason that, that homosexuals should not be allowed in the military, he said, can you imagine what would happen if a lieutenant had sex with a private? And I'm thinking, sure, I can imagine that, but that wasn't his point. Um, <laughs> and he said it would destroy, it would destroy chain of command. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, I screwed it up, sorry. He said, sorry, this is very important. He did not say if a lieutenant had sex with a private, he said, can you imagine what would happen if a private had sex with a lieutenant? It makes all the difference in the world. Because he said it would destroy chain of command. Not because the lieutenant would fall so in love with the private that he couldn't order him to his death, but instead, as I said, it would destroy chain of command. Because when you have man fucks woman, subject verb object, when you have sex and violence get conflated and violence can only flow downhill, that means that you have to have a fucker and a fucky with the fucky being lower on the hierarchy than the fucker. And if you have the fucker and the fucky, or if you have the fucker and the fucky are equivalent, then all the little tiny brains seize up. <laughs> and because, because the hierarchy is no longer in place, which, is, which helps me understand, by the way, why a lot of the fundamentalist Christians consider homosexuality a blas blasphemy, because it's sending that sexualized violence the wrong direction. Fifth premise. The property of those higher on the hierarchy is more valuable than the lives of those below. It is acceptable for those above to increase the amount of property they control in everyday language to make money by destroying or taking the lives of those below. This is called production. If those below damage the property of those above, those above may kill or otherwise destroy the lives of those below. This is called justice. Um, sixth premise. Uh, is the one that I sort of alluded to early on. Uh, this culture is not redeemable. The culture won't undergo any sort of voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living. If we don't put a halt to it, Civilization, this culture, will continue to immiserate the vast majority of humans and to degrade the planet until it, civilization, and probably the planet, collapses. The effects of this degradation will continue to harm humans and non-humans for a very long time. Seventh premise. The longer we wait for civilization to crash, or the longer we wait before we ourselves bring it down, the messier will be the crash, and the worse things will be for those humans and non-humans who live during it and for those who come after. If somebody would have brought down civilization, whatever that means, 200 years ago, if Tecumseh would have won, then people in the East would still be able to eat passenger pigeons. I mean, never minding passenger pigeons' beautiful existence for themselves. If somebody would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, people in this region, through the crash, would still be able to eat salmon. There's going to be people sitting along the banks of the Columbia 50 years from now and, well, they'll be glowing for one thing because of Hanford, and they'll also be starving to death, and they'll be saying, I'm starving to death because you allowed the dams to stand. God damn you. And, you know, but the dams are really important. You know, they're necessary for the electricity to make it so safe, Cofield, you can move the, uh, the top back and forth. <laughs> They're necessary to smelt aluminum for beer cans. 
Um, anyway, so the longer we wait, I mean, I mean, if somebody would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, we wouldn't have to worry about much about global warming, and we wouldn't have to worry about the toxification of the total environment with pesticides. We wouldn't have to worry about docks and every mother's breast milk. I mean, if 50 and 75 years from now, are people going to be going, you know, if somebody would have brought it down 75 years ago, we'd still have amphibians. Um, if somebody would brought it down 75 years ago, we would still have, uh, well, somebody would brought it down 15 years ago. They'll be saying 15 years now, from now. We will still, we'd still have sturgeon. You know, it's like, how long? You know, at what point? What's the threshold? You know, 100 years from now, it's like we'd still have, you know, name it. <laughs> we'd still have oceans. Air to breathe. You know, that's not, that's not one of my premises, but, but that's, that's something that, that if I would have thought of it when I was writing the book would have been one of the premises, which is the primary, if not only measure, by which we'll be judged by those who come after is going to be the health of the land base. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we voted Democrat, Republican, Green, anarchist, didn't vote at all. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we recycled. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we were violent or nonviolent. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we're nice people or not nice people. They're not going to give a shit as to whether we uh, wrote great books or made great films or did great talks or anything else. They're going to care about whether they can breathe the air and drink the water. You know, we can all fantasize whatever we want about some groovy eco-socialist utopia with free love everywhere. It doesn't fucking matter if you can't breathe the air and can't drink the water. And the only measure, I mean, it's embarrassing to say this, but the only measure by which any generation will be judged is the health of the land base that they pass on. That brings us to the eighth premise of the book. The needs of the natural world are more important than the needs of the economic system. The needs of the natural world are more important than the needs of the economic system. I have, thanks. I have just guaranteed I will never hold public office. <laughs> Another way to put the eighth premise is, any economic or social system that doesn't benefit the natural communities on which it's based is unsustainable, immoral, and really stupid. <laughs> Sustainability, morality, and intelligence, as well as justice, requires the dismantling of any such economic or social system, or at the very least, disallowing it from damaging your land base. OK, ninth premise. Oh, the ninth premise is pretty interesting. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm getting kind of cold. <clears throat> um, it's pretty interesting. You know, I can bash almost anything I want, and people are cool with it. You know, I can bash capitalism, that's fine. I can bash uh, environmentalism, that's fine. I can bash anarcho-primitivism, that's fine. I can bash myself, that's fine. I can bash blah, 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 it's fine. But there's a few things that you, you like, cannot bash. Um, for example, if I bash, um, oh my god, when I bash science, I can just feel the sphincters in the audience start to quiver. Um, um, or, or also, if I, like, if I bash Buddhism, oh my god. It's like, you have not lived until you've been chased down the street by a bunch of pacifists. Um, 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 or another one that's really hard to talk about is, is, um, is population. And because if you, if you mention that there are more humans on the planet than the planet can support, then people suddenly start to presume that you're actually anti-human, um, which doesn't really follow in my mind. Oh, it's great too, I gotta tell you this, that um, you know, they say there's no such thing as a stupid question. I got one the other day. Um, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm going like, to tell everybody in the country. Um, there's this, this, I sometimes do interviews on a radio station south, one county, down in Humboldt County, one south county south of where I live. And there's this guy who hates, hates me and hates what I say so much that every time I'm on there, he calls up. And I, I'm not sure. I think he attacks me, but I usually can't figure out what the hell he's saying. And, um, and one time I was saying that humans have exceeded carrying capacity. And carrying capacity is the the number of any given species who could live in a particular place forever without harming it. So you could have, um, 
You could have an island that has a carrying capacity of 1,000 deer. 1,000 deer could live there forever. But if you put 10,000 deer there, they're going to uh, eat too much of the vegetation, cause erosion, and lower the carrying capacity, make it so the place can only support 500 deer. Anyway, so I was saying that humans have exceeded carrying capacity. And he called up just sputtering. And he said, how dare you say that humans have exceeded their capacity to care? <laughs> Which may or may not be the case, but that's a different question. Um, anyway, so, so the ninth premise is basically, although there will clearly someday be far fewer humans than there are at present, there are many ways this reduction in population could occur. Some of those ways would be characterized by extreme violence and privation. Nuclear Armageddon, for example, would certainly reduce both population and consumption, yet would do so horrifically. The same would be true for a continuation of overshoot followed by crash. Other ways would be characterized by less violence. Um, you know, and I don't know what is going to happen, obviously, but this much I do know, that if we don't approach these problems actively, if we don't talk about our predicament and what we're going to do about it, the violence will be almost undoubtedly be more severe, the privation more extreme. And I want to be really clear. Every cell in my body wants for us to have a voluntary transformation. Just like every cell in my body wants for, that must be the tow truck. Um, just like every cell in my body wants for people to approach the whole question of there being too many humans, and I'm going to talk more about population in a second. But anyway, every cell in my body wants for us to approach that just reasonably and rationally and intelligently. But of course, we all know what we're going to do is just continue on this freight train to hell until it continues to fly off the cliff. I mean, once again, every cell in my body wants I, I, I was thinking, if I ran for president, um, I think I would go on a platform of vasectomies for everyone. Well, vasectomies for every man. Um, <laughs> Vasectomies on the house. Um, it's, it's, um, and I was, I was, I, I was doing a talk a while ago, and and somebody shouted out when I said that. Somebody shouted out, "Well, what's your campaign slogan?" I was like, "Oh God, I don't know." So I, I opened up the audience, and they came up with a great one, which is a snip in every sack. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm ready to run. Um, okay. So anyway, um, having said that, I need to say, by the way that I don't think that population is actually, yes, there are more humans than the planet can support, but I don't think that population is a primary problem. I think population is actually a tertiary problem. The reason I think population is secondary instead of primary is that I think consumption is way more important. Because when, I mean, actual numbers don't matter. There could be 100 gazillion people on the planet, and if they didn't eat, shit, or stand anywhere, it wouldn't matter. The important thing is how much damage you're causing or how much help you're doing. Imagine that also, that humans can actually benefit their land base. What a strange concept that is. Anyway, um, and that's really important because when I think about overpopulation, the first image that comes to mind is, honestly, is a little brown baby with a distended belly in a third world nation. First image that comes to mind. When I think of overconsumption, the first thing I think of is an American. And who causes more damage? Um, so that's why I don't think the population is a primary problem, but a secondary problem. And the reason I don't think the population is a secondary problem, but is actually a tertiary problem, is because are there any demographers in here? Good. I hate demographers. Um, <laughs> and the reason I hate demographers is because sometimes they talk about something called the natural rate of population growth, which is that if you have X number of people then you know, the population exponentially rises, blah, blah, blah. And it presumes that people breed like rabbits. And the truth is, I don't even think rabbits breed like rabbits. Um, it presumes that people don't make rational family planning decisions based upon their personal and social circumstances. Once again, the Tala will live there for 12,500 years in relatively steady state. And part of the reason is because they had an intimate relationship with their land base, and they would perceive damage to the land base as damage. And if perhaps they start to have too many babies, well, let's cut back. And I mean, you would think, I mean, let's just think about this. What happens if you have a culture where somebody writes a book, and in this book they tell people to go forth and multiply, and this book becomes a really big bestseller? <laughs> um, that's going to affect family planning decisions. Um, and also, I need to say this too, that there were, in Native North America, there were about 250 different 
um, plants that were used as contraceptives and abortifactants by, um, by the women. And the decisions to use those were made by women. Bunch of fucking primitives. Um, and yeah, imagine that. And oh, it's, I got to tell you the story too. This is so cool. Is um, back uh, at one point, you know, a bunch of male anthropologists went out, and you know, anthropologists like exclusively male at one point, and a bunch of anthropologists went out, and they were they were trying to find out what indigenous peoples would use for contraceptive. And they would go talk to the men, because of course the men are the only ones we're talking to. And they'd say, so how do you not make babies? And they're like, that is a really good question. <laughs> and so a lot of the anthropologists were saying, hmm, indigenous people don't know where babies come from. And then when, um, when women started getting into anthropology, the women would go talk to the, the, the indigenous peoples and they would talk to the women and they would say, you know, how do you not get pregnant? And the women would say, oh, you know, if you take this certain route when you're 16, then you're sterile for five years and when you, you know, then when you're 20, then you have to do this and this. And the men are like, really? <laughs> I had no idea. Um, oh, I want to say one more thing about population, which is that, um, which is that, uh, you know, the, the whole thing about making a, uh, a wall down in, down in Mexico or down at the border of Mexico and how we need to stop all those Mexicans from coming up and the Central Americans and the El Guatemalans and the Nicaraguans or whatever their names are. Um, the, uh, I have to say, that I am actually strongly in favor of closing the border to Mexico um, on one condition, um, which is that if you close it to people, you close it to the movement of resources as well. Um, 